Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Berkowitz. I'm the Tad and Diane Toby Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. For these past two years, I served as a director of the policy planning staff in the State Department. I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, this afternoon to this edition of Hoover Capital Conversations. To those of you who are unfamiliar with the Hoover Institution, let me tell you briefly about it. For the more than a century, our fellowship and world-renowned world -renowned library and archives have been collecting knowledge and generating ideas that support freedom and promote prosperity. Our work is distinguished by its grounding in scholarly inquiry and in empirical research. Capital Conversations features discussions between those who generate the ideas sustaining a free society and those who turn them into actionable policy. These conversations invite you to listen and to participate in discussions between Hoover Fellows and policymakers as we explore some of the nation's most difficult problems. Today, we will be, take, we will be talking to Senator Bill Haggerty, examining US strategy in the Indo-Pacific. I wanna emphasize that as part of the discussion, we will be taking audience questions. We encourage you as we're going right along to submit yours at the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. Let's get started. Uh, I am delighted and honored to welcome uh, Senator Haggerty to Capital Conversations. In 2020, he was elected to the US Senate representing the great state of Tennessee. Prior to becoming a Senator, he served as US Ambassador to Japan, in the Trump administration, as a member of the governor's cabinet in Tennessee, and then also as a commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development. Before that, he enjoyed a very successful career as a businessman and an investor. Currently, he serves on several Senate committees, rules and administration, banking, housing, and urban affairs, foreign relations, and appropriations. Um, if we weren't restricted by our subject matter and given that the Senator sits on rules and administrations, I would very much like to ask him about the future of the filibuster, but we will, we will maintain our focus on Indo-Pacific strategy and maybe other areas of foreign policy. In the meantime, welcome Senator Haggerty. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Peter, it's wonderful to be with you and, and my hat's off to the accomplishments of the Hoover Institution. I've relied on Hoover to help me along the way when I was serving as ambassador. Uh, the, the, the thought leadership that Hoover brings to bear is incredibly important uh, to our international relations and to America's leadership role in the world. I look forward to continuing our great relationship now as a member of the United States Senator, as Senate, particularly uh, given my committee assignments, I think we're gonna have many opportunities to interact. Uh, I'm looking forward also to talking about areas where I think there's a great opportunity for bipartisan cooperation here. And uh, this is an area where I think uh, we, we often say, and it, it should be the case, that uh, partisanship should end at America's shores and we need to be working lockstep to advance America's interests abroad. And I look forward to doing that here in the United States Senate with my Democrat colleagues. Well, thank you very much for those generous words and uh, the sensibility you present is also really music to, to my ears and uh, I think to all my colleagues at the Hoover Institution. Um, let's just talk uh, at least a little bit about, uh, about your time in Japan serving as US ambassador. You could tell us a bit about what did you learn serving a, about the United States, about Japan and about the role of American diplomacy? Well, I, I, I would first say this, Peter, the United States is the most exceptional nation in the world and there could be no higher honor than to represent the United States with any foreign country. And certainly with a country that is an ally as close to us as Japan uh, was my highest honor. I'd had the opportunity to live in Japan for three years during my business career. I was with a firm called the Boston Consulting Group and they sent me to Tokyo for three years uh, from the years 1988 to 91. Very different time in the world. At that point, uh, Japan had recently surpassed the Soviet Union to become the number two economy in the world. If you think about it, the trade tensions were enormous between the United States and Japan then. Some of our viewers today may remember this, but you had United Auto Workers here in America smashing dots and cars with sledgehammers. You had congressmen here in Washington breaking Sony and Toshiba radios on the stairs of the US Capitol. 
uh, a tremendous amount of trade tension. And at the time, uh, the, the juggernaut that was the Japanese economy was getting many of the same criticisms that you hear about China today with one main difference. I think Japan was moving aggressively from an economic standpoint, but they did not have the same geopolitical and strategic perspective that China does. But it was very helpful to have had that experience in Japan, again, as a younger man, uh, now coming back, uh, or when I came back a second time, a uh, wonderful opportunity to share that with my family uh, mm -hmm. and experience Japan in a very different way. But as the United States ambassador to Japan, we have a very important role to play uh, as allies. I think many of you know this, but we have more U.S. military stationed in Japan than any place else in the world. The reason for that is very simple. Japan's situated in a tough neighborhood. You've got North Korea, Russia, and China right at your doorstep. I spent a great amount of time working on national security and defense-related defense related issues as a result of that. But also, Japan's the third largest economy in the world now. It's the United States, China, and then Japan. They're critically important as a trading partner. And while I was there, I worked very hard to accelerate Japan's capital investment into America to get them to produce in America what they sell in America. And Japan ramped up that production, committing more capital to the American economy than any other nation on the planet uh, during my tenure there. So I think that's a great success, you know, continuing to strengthen our economic ties, even as we work more closely together. And I'm sure we'll get into it on the Quad and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so we'll, we'll turn to the Quad in uh, just a second. Um, but I did want to follow up and ask you, um, building on your achievements in Japan, Trump administration achievements, what, what's next for, what should be next for the Bi Biden administration? Or, or as you invited us to think about it, what ought Congress, both sides of the aisle, be focusing on now, 2021, in regard to the bilateral relationship U.S.-Japan? And there is a great degree of bilateral support for the U.S.-Japan relationship. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make certain that we continue to move in that direction. What my colleagues here tell me is they want to continue to see us strengthen that relationship. As we're able to travel again, uh, we, we, we want to spend more time. I've talked with my friends in Japan about increasing the exchange between their diet members and our members of Congress. I think that will be a very good thing to have legislative branch connectivity, just as we work so hard to have executive branch connectivity. I think you saw this happen. Uh, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin made their very first stop overseas, Japan. And you will see the first summit take place face to face between Prime Minister Suga and President Biden here next month. So we continue to hold that relationship as a cherished relationship. Again, in a bipartisan basis, we prioritize it. And I'm going to do everything that I can to continue supporting it because I think the challenges are only getting greater. And by that, I mean the challenges in that neighborhood. Uh, we face the same concerns uh, here in America that Japan does, yet Japan is more proximate to, to those right. concerns. By that, I'm talking about what's happening in North Korea. Uh, a lot of the things that, that China is doing uh, have actually stepped up. Uh, more recently, I'm talking about their aggression in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. And economically, we share the same concerns as well in terms of intellectual property theft, heavy subsidization of state-owned champions like Huawei. Uh, you've got a very difficult time trying to make entry to the Chinese market uh, equivalent and reciprocal to what they're allowed to do here in America or in Japan because the local regulations are so different. You have to take on a Chinese partner. You have to share your your intellectual property with them, transfer your technology. These are not mainstream rules. These are not market-based rules. And the fact that China operates beyond the market norms is something we need to address. And, and Japan feels the same way. Um, thank you very much, Ben. Let, let's continue talking about um, Japan's tough, tough neighborhood. As you know, in 2005, Prime Minister Abe of Japan played a leading role in, in initiating the Quad, United States, India, Australia, and Japan. The purpose was to counter the threat um, posed by the People's Republic of China to a free and open Indo-Pacific, I think uh, uh, a Prime Minister Abe uh, term. Um, it, how indeed. You, indeed. How, so how, tell us how, how you understand in general uh, the China challenge in the Indo-Pacific. What do you regard as the Quad's ma major accomplishments to date? Um, Trump administration's role in strengthening it, and same question as before, what, what's next for the Quad? Well, 
I, I'd like to talk about China first to put this into context. I, I, I use the term strategic adversary, Peter. China is our strategic adversary. And who knows that better than the other, uh, the, the other nations that are in the Indo-Pacific? India has had great difficulty with China on their border of recent. You, you, you know what's happened there. Uh, just just an, an incredibly offensive uh, military incursion by the Chinese and, 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 and that problem that has resulted in deaths of Indians. Um, they have the same problems in India that, that we have uh, here in America, in Japan and Australia, and that's intellectual property theft, unfair trade. You go to Australia, Australia has felt the brunt of China's economic retaliation when they didn't like what Australia had to say. Uh, and then you've got Japan dealing with China on so many fronts. The Senkakus is just one of many, but with the change in the laws about basically militarizing the Chinese Coast Guard, I think Japan is, is rightly very, very concerned. What it means is that we need to work more closely with India, with Australia, with Japan, with other like-minded nations. As it, we, we talk about the Quad, and again, because of proximity in our presence, it's a maritime presence there, but there are many other nations I think that we can work more closely with as we continue to stand up to this strategic adversary, as we continue to stand up to China that does not play by the same set of rules that the rest of the world does. And we continue to stand up for what's right for our economy and our people and call out what's happening wrong. And by there, I'm talking about genocide of the Uyghur population, the encroachment on Hong Kong, the threats to Taiwan. This is unacceptable under any, under any, any set of rules. And I think the more nations that step up and call it what it is, the better. Well, um, inspiring words, and uh, we very much appreciate um, the tough stance you're taking toward, uh, toward China. I want to ask you maybe about what one specific area in which the Trump administration um, focused, one of many. Um, as you know, Trump administration sought to rally friends, partners, allies around the world to reject um, the use of Chinese national companies, Huawei and ZTE, to provide um, uh, the, fit, the infrastructure for digital communications. Um, you've given some thought to the importance of that effort and what's involved in that effort. Could, could you discuss it a bit for us, please? Certainly. This has been a concern of mine since the beginning of my service as ambassador. It remains the top of my concern today. Uh, and, and I like to take this on two dimensions as well. One is the national security dimension. And I think there's a lot of conversation about that, Peter. The other is the economic dimension, the dimension and the, the impact on innovation. And, I, and I'll come to that separately because it's a, it's a topic that does not get aired well enough. From a national security standpoint, one needs only go back to 2017 and read the national security law that China passed. It requires any company that's a Chinese domicile company to share the information that they have on their systems, share the information they have on their customers. And if you think about embedding a Chinese supplier like a Huawei, like a ZTE, there are a number of other similarly situated companies there in China. If you embed them in your critical infrastructure, the information that passes across that infrastructure to the extent Huawei has access to it is now accessible to the uh, national security interests of, of uh, China, to their, to their intelligence agencies. This is wholly unacceptable from a national security standpoint. If you think about the threat that that poses, if China were to somehow decide to use that information in a nefarious way, if they were somehow to exert even more control, it could cripple an economy, it could cripple a nation. Think about 5G here in America. It's not just telecommunications. We're going to plug our electric grid into that. Autonomous vehicles are gonna to have to rely on that 5G system to maneuver, to communicate. It's incredibly dangerous to put a Chinese Communist Party influenced company in the, in, in, the, in the supply chain of this infrastructure when that law exists and is on the books. I think that law just underscores what their intention is in China. And as they go out and you know, deploy, as China goes out and deploys its economic diplomacy, they offer these infrastructure products at below market rates. They're doing this to install their infrastructure around the world. It poses huge threats. That's the national security piece. The question often arises though, well, why don't we have as good a solution in, in, in the West? Why don't we have as good a solution in Japan, in South Korea, in other parts of the world? The answer is very simple. As you mentioned, and given my background, I've been an investor most of my life. 
I think about allocating capital in areas where I can actually obtain a return on that capital. If you look at a company like Huawei, and I'll pick on them this because that, that's the one that's most talked about in the news, yes. roughly 200,000 employees. They've got the balance sheet of China behind them. They operate not necessarily with a profit interest, but with a strategic interest. How do I compete against that? How do I invest against that? Knowing that I've got a company that size, a national champion to fight against that has the balance sheet of an entire nation behind it. Investors are not going to move into that space. Innovators are not going to put their time and capital into that space when the market is contaminated by a state-owned champion like a Huawei, like a ZTE, and so forth. By clearing our markets, which is what President Trump did, by banning these types of companies from operating in America, we've opened up the largest market in the world. Japan's followed suit. The third largest market now is open to innovation and investment. Australia's followed suit. New Zealand's followed suit. I think the UK is close. We need to continue to do this to get other nations to recognize the national security threat, but also the threat to innovation, the way it kills innovation is significant. I'll come now to something that gives me great optimism that this is going to expand. And that's called the Clean Network Initiative. That happened, Peter, you were there at the State Department. Uh, that initiative now has roughly 200 telecommunications companies signed up to it around the world. About 60 countries are participating in this. That investment makes a huge statement to countries like China. That investment, I think, underscores the fact that more and more nations are waking up to the threat and to the need to work together. I've had some very stern conversations with people in the State Department because the State Department has now taken the Clean Network Initiative off of its website and archived it. I spoke with Secretary Blinken about it. He was unaware of that. I'm not surprised he's dealing with a lot right now. But I underscored to him the fact that this sends the wrong message to our partners. We've already got momentum in place. From a business person's perspective like me, if you were to acquire a company that had a product that already had that type of momentum, the last thing you would do is set it aside. We've built the brand. We should continue to move and build upon this momentum. Whether you call it the Clean Network Initiative or you want to rebrand it, uh, something that the Biden Initiative, you know, whatever they like to say, the momentum is what's critical. And I, I think Secretary Blinken understands that clearly. That's the way we begin to move more nations to, to the point of realization that it's both a security threat and an innovation killer not to have your markets clear and clean. And to the extent we can keep that momentum moving, I have optimism that we'll be able to keep our networks free and clear of this danger. Well, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to hear that. And a lot of credit goes not only to Secretary Pompeo, but under Secretary Keith Krug for really pushing the clean network. And maybe one follow up question on that matter. Um, in addition to um, uh, offering encouraging advice to Secretary Blinken, are there, um, do, do you envisage legislative actions that can be undertaken by Congress? To, um, uh, to advance the efforts of the represented by the Clean Network? Well, you, you, you were very kind to mention Secretary Pompeo and Under Secretary Keith Kroc. I want to say a word or two about Keith. Uh, his vision made a huge difference in this arena. I spoke with him just last week about this. I've encouraged him to come to Washington to continue to remain involved in this. Uh, I, I'd like to introduce him to folks in the new administration. Again, this should not be a partisan issue. We have a bipartisan in interest in moving this forward. And Keith is one of the foremost thinkers in this arena in the world. And to have had the benefit of his service for a couple of years, I know you served alongside him, Peter. Um, we need to maintain the momentum and we need vision like his. And I'm sure there are others from the private sector that can come in and help us continue to move this forward and innovate with this. And I'm happy to support to whatever extent necessary from a legislative perspective, the continued momentum in this direction. But America has great talent and great innovative capacity. And you look no further than someone like Keith Kroc to say, we can do this. If we have people like that that are willing to invest their time and their energy and their creative capability, America cannot, cannot fail. But we've got to be willing to harness that, to take it out of the partisan arena and move it forward on a, on a very bipartisan basis. Couldn't agree more. And we hope to take advantage of, uh, of Keith, who, as you know, lives out in the, in the Bay Area also at uh, Hoover Institution, take mm -hmm. advantage of the great work he's already done. Before we go, to, um, before we go to, to questions from, from our viewers, I wanted to go 
just a bit beyond our official purview today, the Indo-Pacific, but especially facing the China challenge, uh, all regions of the world are in play, so we have to be attentive to them. Uh, I have it on good authority that another one of your keen interests is uh, Middle East politics. I understand that you're sponsoring um, uh, legislation specifically related to the Islamic Republic of, of Iran. I was hoping that you could tell us both about that legislation, how you viewed uh, the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign, and your assessment a few months in of the uh, Biden administration's approach to the Middle East. Well, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the Biden administration's approach to many things that occurred, many successful things that occurred in the Trump administration. And I understand the fever of a heated political battle. I understand the, 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 the heat that comes with a hard fought election, but that can't blind one to the fact that there were real successes under the Trump administration. And to come in on a knee jerk basis, whether it's you know eliminating the remain in Mexico policy and creating a crisis at our border, or you know, reentering the the, uh, the Paris Climate Accord without getting anything for it, uh, as you know, most of the nations had not complied with their obligations under that treaty. And China, we'll get to this, is, is laughing all the way to the bank on that one. The Keystone XL pipeline, again, making us less energy independent, making us more vulnerable to other nations and technologies like solar and wind that are primarily produced in China. Again, moving us in the wrong direction. Uh, the situation with Iran perhaps is at the forefront mm. of my concerns. The desire to reenter the JCPOA was obvious during the entire Trump administration because you had former Secretary Kerry working very hard as a private citizen, yes. uh, you know, engaging with the Iranian regime, I'm sure uh, trying to advise them on how to either wait us out or, or how to navigate around the system. Uh, and you know, it's, it's very, very concerning to me that the first thing that the Biden administration does is point to the fact that they want to rejoin. They engage with the Europeans. Now, look, I know what the Europeans' objective is. They want to trade with Iran. They don't have the same existential threat that the Middle East partners that we enjoy relationships with do. They're not talking with Saudi. They're not talking with the Israelis. They're letting the Europeans manage this uh, engagement. And what the Europeans would like to see is a relief of sanctions. It took a lot of work to put those sanctions in place, as you well know, Peter. This is well beyond just the JCPOA. The Iranian regime wants the economic sanctions lifted that sure. are having a real biting effect. And if you look at what's happening to their domestic economy, it had begun to have a real effect. It is. So you know, there, there are some very real concerns there, but I worked very closely with, with the team at the State Department, for example, to get Japan to stop buying Iranian crude. That was not easy. <laughs> that was not an easy accomplishment to get them to agree to do that. Um, those sanctions took a tremendous amount of work to put in place. And to just come in and tear them off and, and, and not get anything for that, I think is a great concern. So you're going to see me continue to push back and push back hard. But we want to have improved relations in the Middle East. But Iran continues to fund and encourage you know, terrorist activity against America and against our allies in that region. And we need to be working much more closely with our allies directly in the Middle East region to deal with this threat and this problem. So it's a point that you're going to see me remain engaged in. Uh, right. I've got some, some legislation that we're working on right now that would extend the same terms. If you, you remember this from your service to the administration, the, the same agreement review terms that were put in place for Russia under the Trump administration, we need to have those same terms for any agreement that's, that's drawn up with Iran any adjustment to the agreement that used to exist with Iran needs to come here for congressional review. And I'm very optimistic we're going to get that to a point that we'll be able to send a very strong message to Iran that if this is properly presented as a treaty to this, to, to, to this Congress, uh, there's going to be a very serious review that's going to be required. Well, th thank you very much. That's also, uh, to my ears, very encouraging. Uh, one more question before, uh, I guess, before we go to the viewers. Uh, I return us to, uh, to the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. One of... Uh, one of Japan's uh, neighbors. Um, over the weekend, uh, North Korea uh, test fired two short range cruise missiles, uh, reported to us by uh, South Korea. Um, looking back, how do you assess Trump administration, North Korea policy um, now, March 2021? 
What must the United States do to ensure North Korea restraint? Well, let me go back to Trump administration policy and share with you a little analysis I did uh, before sitting down with President-elect Trump to talk about what my duties would be in Japan. Uh, I look back at what had happened during 2016 with North Korea. And the acceleration of their missile testing and launch firing had gone up exponentially. It, they, they had done more testing in the 10 months of data I had, January through October, than they had done in a dozen years prior. The acceleration of that effort was, was obvious. The fact that we were going to be at a testing point with North Korea was clear. In fact, President Obama warned President Trump, as he, the day he came into office, that this would be his most significant challenge. There was no surprise there. Why was that? Well, we spent eight years, quote, leading from behind. The administration policy toward North Korea was called strategic patience. I don't know if there are any parents on this. Uh, <laughs> on this. I've got four children. Strategic patience, uh, I'd like you to apply that to your kids and tell me what's going to happen. It's chaos. They they ran while they did what they wanted to do, and they <coughs> built a nuclear program at a much more accelerated pace. The time came to stand up to North Korea and let them know that we weren't going to continue to come in and do the kind of negotiating that they you know, gamed, gamed us with in the past. And so that brought out the maximum pressure campaign. And you know what? With the help of Japan, we were able to get the United Nations Security Council to unanimously agree, this includes Russia and China, to agree to three consecutively tighter sets of economic sanctions on North Korea, biting sanctions. That really put the, that really put things to a test, and that led to the condition for us to have, you know, a, a, finally a dialogue with Kim Jong Un himself. And you know how difficult it is to negotiate with the North Koreans. Uh, Steve Began, who was our envoy to North Korea, said that his counterparts often changed. Uh, he never saw them again uh, if a meeting had not gone exactly as. Kim Jong-un might have hoped. So uh, very difficult to deal with anybody other than the top uh, with that regime. What we saw was a, was a quelling of the activity. Uh, I think what we're seeing right now happening with the most recent uh, launch over the weekend is another opportunity to test the Biden administration and see if they're going to do something different. Are they going to stay with maximum pressure, which Japan would certainly like to see us continue. I would like to see us continue that, that maximum pressure campaign. Are they going to revert to something from the past that uh, was much more uh, much more fruitful for North Korea, yet yielded no results for us. So we're gonna have to continue to wait and see what, what happens there. China plays an enormous role in all of this, as you know, Peter. Uh, but what concerns me is that the ship-to-ship -ship transfers have stepped up. Uh, yes. Also concerned about what's happening inside of North Korea with this pandemic. Um, you know, they, they say that they don't have the coronavirus, but, uh, I've got to believe in a country like theirs that shares a common border with South Korea, um, they would have the same sort of infection rates that, that other nations would have. Their health system is very, very fragile. Their economy uh, is, is, has been damaged significantly because the borders have been shut. That's killed off you know, uh, their, you know, the majority of all their trade, even though it's illicit, uh, it's going to put their economy, it must have put their economy in a very difficult situation. So when you have that sort of instability that's likely occurring there, uh, I think we need to be very concerned and watch this situation very closely. Thanks very much. For those just joining us, I'm Hoover Senior Fellow Peter Berkowitz. This is Hoover's Capital Conversations with Senator uh, Bill Haggerty. Um, Senator, we're now going to go to questions from, uh, from our viewers. Uh, the first question is from Richard. Richard writes, the dressing down we experienced during the first meeting with our and China's leaders was embarrassing. What can leadership on both sides of the aisle do to tamp down the current political verbal warfare and inaction? We are playing into their hands. The first thing I would say, Peter, as uh, someone who's negotiated most of his life, is that we shouldn't agree to uh, open press meetings like that that are gonna be made to order for the domestic audience in China. I just think that was uh, you know, an unfortunate thing to have happened. Uh, and I don't think anyone in America was happy with it. Um, that, was, you know, that, that, that was something that I would say would have been predictable given the circumstances. We should not agree to any more meetings like that. At the same time, we've got to continue to show American strength and we need to continue to call out uh, what China is doing 
and be strong and, and, and forthright about that. And I intend to support this administration in their efforts to do just that. And I'm going to continue to encourage them in that regard. Thank you very much. We have another question from, um, uh, without a name, the question is, China has recently imposed harsh tariffs on various goods from Australia, wine, Taiwan, fruits and vegetables, seemingly because they are aligned with US policy. Has China taken similar trade-related action against Japan? Uh, Japan is a larger economy than Australia, and the interconnectivity uh, between the two economies is, is high. Uh, you know, Australia took the, took the, I wouldn't say bold move, but I'd say the appropriate move of calling a situation what it is with respect to China. And China felt they had the, the, the clout and the latitude to, you know, to impose, uh, to, to impose crushing, crushing economic, economic impact on Australia for doing that. Uh, they're sending a message to the rest of the world. I, I applaud the Australians for standing up and we need to support them. And to the extent that our other trading partners can fill that void for Australia, let's encourage that. Uh, with respect to Japan, they are very proximate to uh, China. And I think they rightly are very concerned. They're dealing with China. Japan is dealing with China on a daily basis from a military standpoint. We're all dealing with China from a diplomatic standpoint. Look at their influence in the UN and the WHO, which has been widely broadcast. And then from a technology standpoint and an economic standpoint, China's economy is the second largest in the world. We're engaging with them every day there, and they use their economic might as a lever, witness the case with Australia. So we need to, to be able to address that as well. And as allies, I hope we can find ways to, to, to help our partner allied nations when they do encounter that type of mistreatment. Let me throw a, a follow-up question to a question number two. Uh, in his first foreign policy speech on February 4th, President Biden. Um, actually seemed to uh, adopt language that came from the Trump administration. He recognized China as America's most important strategic competitor. He made reference to this authoritarian moment. He said, we have to focus on, on the China challenge. Um, strong words. Uh, how, how confident are you uh, two months into the Biden administration is going to act on those strong words? Well, let me go back to, I, I appreciate the words and I appreciate the fact that he's relying heavily on the previous administration. This should not be a partisan issue. Yes. Uh, it, it, we, we should continue to build on America's strengths, administration to administration. That's the appropriate approach to take. But, but at the same time, the Biden administration came in and, and began to just willy-nilly uh, kick out and destroy Trump policies. The rush to get back into the Paris Climate Accord is a huge advantage to China because what does that do? It increases our energy cost. If you think about factor cost in, in, in America, they just went up thanks to this. All of our listeners have to just look at, think, think about what gas costs in California right now. It's over $4.50 a gallon. This is not helping our economy. Where is the oil gonna go from the Keystone XL pipeline? They're gonna move it to Vancouver and ship it straight to China. And again, China is gonna manufacture the wind turbines and the solar panels that we're supposed to be putting in place here. Those green jobs just don't pop overnight. What they're gonna do is increase our trade deficit with China. So these policies didn't start us off on the right foot, but I appreciate the, the willingness of President Biden to step up and have you know, a leaders meeting of the Quad. I thought that was from a symbolic standpoint, very important. We need to continue to follow up with that relationship and strengthen it. Uh, I appreciate the fact that um, you know, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin made it their priority as well to go to Japan, to, to, to South Korea as their first trip. Uh, this is important. And so to the extent we can continue uh, the, the, the policies of the previous administration, build upon them, I'm here to help. And I think I've got plenty of colleagues on both sides of the aisle here that uh, would, would be willing to step up and do the same. Very happy to hear that. Um... This is a question from Dave. There's a talk that UK, France, and Germany may join the Quad along with South Korea. Should that happen, it could become NATO Indo-Pacific. Please share your opinion about this alliance possibility. Is that a good thing or a good, a bad thing, the expansion of the Quad in that way? I, I, I would welcome any allies, but I wanna make certain that our allies understand 
and appreciate, again, the fact that China is a strategic adversary. I worry about some of those countries that you mentioned, taking Huawei into their infrastructure, for example. We need to make certain that we're aligned on all points here. And our ability to share intelligence information, that type of thing, is going to be constrained heavily if these nations don't understand and appreciate the fact that China is trying to strategically embed their technology in other nations' systems. We've got to stand up on all fronts here. And so I, again, applaud and welcome more nations coming into the fold. But I think we need to be thinking about it from a technology standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a military standpoint, and from a diplomatic standpoint. And we need to be aligned on all fronts. Which, of course, implies that uh, the, the United States has to, I think, continue to do what the Trump administration did, which was travel around the world explaining the urgency and the gravity of the China challenge. Indeed. Um, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work. And if you think about the trade relationships that China enjoys with nations like Germany, for example, the argument gets even harder. So it's going to take a lot of work. And, and, and you know, I think it's possible. I think it's entirely possible. But it's going to take a, it's going to take a great deal of effort. Yes. And uh, if you don't mind my adding it, it shouldn't be difficult for the United States to show empathy for other major countries whose economies are entangled with that of China in as much as our economy is entangled with that of China. And we need to navigate those same very difficult waters. Exactly, Peter. And Japan is in the same boat. So I, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Terrific. Thank you. Here's a question from Emily. Would you please talk a bit about human rights? Sorry. Um, would you please talk a bit about human rights throughout the Indo-Pacific, including as far as Indonesia, and the approaches the U.S. should take in regards to supporting human rights around the world? The United States is a beacon of democracy, and we've always been a champion of human rights. Uh, we're one of the few nations that has been willing to stand up and call out the human rights violations that are taking place in China on a massive scale. If you look at what's happening to the, to the, to the Uyghur population, and Peter, I know you were involved in this, but Secretary Pompeo made the determination that indeed it was genocide there, and we've been very clear about that. And Secretary Blinken has acknowledged that problem as well. Uh, we need to continue to look for, for problems like this around the world and call it out wherever, wherever necessary and wherever possible. Much appreciated. I think we have time for a very brief answer to a very large question. Okay. This is from Douglas. Uh, can you compare and contrast how the U.S. should manage affairs with China to U.S. policy toward the former Soviet Union? Can containment work or do we need a different policy? We have about two minutes for that. Big question. The, the former Soviet Union's economy is far smaller than, than China's. So the economic integration that exists with China is, makes it a far different discussion than, than dealing with Russia. It, Russia has you know, natural resources and energy. They have a sophisticated military and intelligence operations. China has a massive economy, a massive population, and you know a very big economic impact on the rest of the world. So I think we're going to have to address China differently and realize that uh, that, that China is too large a market to ignore. Right. Uh, they are positioned in an extremely strategic place, and their activities dealing with their own people, uh, whether it be the Uyghurs, the people in Hong Kong, or the threats they want to pose to their neighbors uh, is something that we need to be dealing with uh, in a very coordinated manner. And that's why I applaud the activity with the Quad. And I think we should continue to, to support it. And as mentioned earlier, uh, find opportunities to grow it. Fantastic. I'm, uh, until we have time for one more question. This is from Alex. From the information that was presented, to the, presented the dangers to US and our allies seem to be clearly obvious. How do you explain that? How do you explain that there are congressmen and other politicians that do not support you in your efforts? I, you know, I, as, as I as we sort of began this conversation, Peter, this should not be a partisan issue. And I think that there are people in Washington that just have a knee-jerk reaction that if one side likes A, then we've got to like Z. And, you know, that's what we have to put behind us. And I, I think the challenge, and that's something that Hoover can help with, is, is if politicians realize the magnitude of this challenge, this is too big for just politics. This is too big to have a tit for tat. 
this is something that we've got to lock arms and address together. So I think that the Hoover Institution can play an important role in helping clarify that. And I think all of the people that are listening today should be talking with those members of Congress to let them know uh, that we need to find ways to work together to, again, continue to advance America's interest against what I view as our largest strategic competitor. Well, well, I I should say that I agree with you entirely. It does fall upon the Hoover Institution now to assist in educating the whole of the American public about the, uh, the urgency, the gravity, the comprehensiveness of the China challenge. And on behalf of the Hoover Institution, I'm going to say thank you to Senator uh, Haggerty. It's very important that there are such uh, passionate and uh, articulate spokesmen for um, for American interests in the Indo- Indo-Pacific as yourself. Um, this is all we have time for today. Again, I want to thank you for your time, your thoughtfulness, your service, and for a great conversation. Thank you, Peter, and thanks to everybody that attended today. Thank you. Viewers can learn more about this series at uh, hoover.org forward slash capital conversations. Thank you all for joining us today. And I hope, hope you'll tune back in on March 31st for discussion with my colleague, Michael McConnell, Michael McConnell and Senators Mike Lee on executive power under the US Constitution. Good afternoon.